I'll tell you that I'm committed to it. All right. I'm in. I'm in. And we got two. Southwest Light Rail moves ahead with a rally in North Minneapolis and a green light from the Met Council. Jennifer Munt is very much on board. This is Democratic Visions. Here's producer Jeff Strait. An important decision was made on the Southwest Light Rail Transit Project on April 9th. Aye. The Met Council accepted the recommended budget, scope, and alignment of the project. The southwest end of the new green line will operate from a station near Eden Prairie City Hall to Target Field. It will include two light rail tunnels, a bike trail, and freight rail through the Kenilworth Corridor in Minneapolis, and an operations and management facility in Hopkins. The east leg of the Green Line to downtown St. Paul begins operating on June 14. Our side of the equation, if there are no delays, will begin passenger service in 2019. Its estimated cost is $1.7 billion. We welcome to this table Jennifer Munn, one of Southwest Light Rail's chief champions. Tell me, what stage of the planning uh, is uh, the project in right now? We're entering a 75-day municipal consent process where... Municipal consent, that's a $20 phrase. What does it mean? Municipal consent means that all five of the cities along the line have to sign off on the project before we can move forward with construction. So Minneapolis, St. Louis Park, Hopkins, Minnetonka, and Eden Prairie will all have discussions with their residents before we move the project forward. What we're bringing to them are the scope and the, and the budget for the project, and they get to sign off on that. They're gonna, are they, they're gonna be public hearings, right, where folks down my street can show up and ask questions. Typically what happens during municipal consent is neighbors will come and say, how is this going to affect my property? How am I going to be able to access the station? Sure. Businesses are already stepping forward and saying, gosh, couldn't we add an additional station because we see that it would benefit our business or mm -hmm. our property. Mm -hmm. um, we have folks in Minnetonka who are interested in having a light rail station near some high density apartment buildings. So this, this is the opportunity to negotiate for the things that each city will need in order to maximize the potential of the stations in their area. Now, when are these uh, hearings going to happen? Different well, times in different cities? The, the Met Council has already sent design plans to the cities. We will hold a public hearing with the Met Council in Hennepin County on May 12th, and then the cities will each have 45 days to offer municipal consent. Typically what will happen is a city will invite people who live within a quarter mile of the light rail station and the tracks and they'll invite the general public. People will have the opportunity to come and weigh in and ask questions and raise whatever concerns they have about the light rail. Uh, Jennifer, you live in Minnetonka and you are a Met Council member for District 3. Now, District 3 includes 16 suburban cities in the Lake Minnetonka area, including Eden Prairie and Minnetonka. How long have you been a, a fan or a supporter, advocate, and champion of light rail? I was a champion of light rail when I came out of college, and I worked for Hennepin County Commissioner John Darris. At the time, he envisioned 20 light rail tunnels underneath downtown Minneapolis. And at the time, he negotiated the deal, which allowed the county to acquire the right of way that makes light rail affordable today. He, um, he called it Operation Prairie Fire. The counties in the metro area wanted to acquire um, abandoned a railroad right of way for future light rail service. Folks in greater Minnesota wanted to acquire those abandoned railroad right-of-ways for snowmobiles and for horseback riding trails. He, he was able to put together a deal that allowed counties to acquire abandoned railroad right-of-way. And because that land was acquired affordably 20 years ago, it makes it possible for us to build light rail projects today. And Jennifer, last fall, Governor Dayton did delay the project. Uh, it's back on track now. What have we learned and where are we going? The pause gave us a chance to do two studies. The first one assured us that the light rail tunnels will not harm our chain of lakes. It also showed us that we haven't overlooked any routes from previous studies. 
that allowed us to also take a look at how we would restore both bikes and trees to the Kenilworth Trail. I think we found that we're able to do that in a way that improves the trail and improves the vegetation that makes it such a beautiful area. Jennifer, I've been attending a lot of meetings since last summer. Significant work and planning have been accomplished, and it's a process that has involved meetups with federal, regional, state, and municipal planners and officials. The ability to move on to Mitchell Road for some of that parking. For the last three years, citizens, businesses, and elected officials along the line have looked at every single decision that helped to shape the scope and the budget for the project. People have weighed in from the ground level, and that's important because it's the citizens who travel in the neighborhoods. They know how best bicyclists and pedestrians can reach their stations. They know best about how we can maximize the potential of every station. Early on, somebody said that the light rail is like a bracelet, and it's our chance to put the charms on that bracelet. That said, it's clear to me that the regional media, print, electronic, and the web, have been obsessed by controversies in Minneapolis and the Kenilworth Corridor and rerouting possibly trains through uh, St. Louis Park. They have ignored Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, Hopkins, and believe it or not, North Minneapolis, which has four stations on its southern apron. No talk about that. That's why I attended this public forum called for by Congressman Keith Ellison in North Minneapolis at the Summit Academy. And when you do set this line coming through here. The forum's charge was to hear what Northside residents, leaders, and public transit advocates had to say about the new light rail line and its stations. Congressman Keith Ellison began by referencing a Martin Luther King speech delivered a half century ago. He said, transit systems have become a genuine civil rights issue and a valid one because the layout of rapid transit systems determines the accessibility to jobs to the black community. That's what he said. Now, from the start of the civil rights movement, transit was central to the struggle. As you may recall, organizing of the sleeping car porters to the Montgomery bus boycott. These civil rights issues started around issues of transit and transportation. And still, uh, we're facing serious transit equity issues here in the Twin Cities today. Low to moderate income households spend about 42% of the total annual income on transportation. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber has been actively engaged in transportation and transit. Well, I've been here 11 years, longer than I've been here. We formed a partnership with the St. Paul Area Chamber 10 years ago to move the business voice for the Central Corridor. We actually knew it was going to cost money, it was going to cost business taxes, and yet we still did it. And a few years ago, two years ago, we put forth or shared in the idea of a new half cent sales tax which would impact business greatly in order to keep transit and transportation moving. So why do we do this? Business people are supposed to be smart about money. Sometimes people say we're too smart about money. We do it because we need this transportation system the same way your body needs a circulation, circulatory system. Everybody should be playing in this game of working in the metro area to further themselves, to further their families, and to further the overall region. Well, how can you be in if you can't get to work? 67% of the people, the 94 million rides, 67% of those are people going to work. 13% are people getting ready to go to work because they're going to education so they can get the best possible job. This is critical, critical for the business community, and critical for all of you and all of us. We also do not have enough people to do the jobs of tomorrow. I know it sounds hard to believe today when we know people that are out of work or are underserved by work with part-time jobs, but in the next five or six years, we will not have enough qualified workers for those jobs. And then we need to bring people here that don't live in Minneapolis St. Paul Marketplace now. And we need those millennials, we need the 25, 35-year-olds to come here, and what brings them? Options work options, play options, transportation options. So if we don't have those options, plenty of other cities do, and plenty of other cities are building more quickly than we are to make those options happen. It's a shame and I think it's a crime that the congressman can quote from Dr. King and it can still be relevant to us today.
50 years ago, somewhere in the line, you know, the spigot gets closed off and it doesn't quite reach us. Mm. Y'all know who I mean by us, right? Yeah. I think it's time that we begin to correct those obstacles and those, pro uh, those problems that are in the way because, yes, we need a viable transit system and transportation system in North Minneapolis. We do. But then the economic engine that's going to run alongside and cooperate with because it is in our neighborhood is going to provide the sustainability and the access that we need to truly be the equitable communities that we need. So one of the things that I think we need is we, I think we need my good friend Commissioner Haig here uh, to talk with my other good friend's wife, uh, Mayor Hodges, about how we get around these obstacles. If we miss this opportunity, we miss a key strategy to make the investments to North Minneapolis to connect us, yes, to jobs, but also to wealth. We don't need to just be getting money in our pockets. We need to be putting money in the bank. As a community, when we build this 21st century transit system, we not only create good jobs for workers building a light rail line, we create economic development for the whole Twin Cities. But our cities are struggling to get the Southwest light rail line done. I would urge everyone here to call your city council member, call your mayor, and urge them to support the Southwest Light Rail. If our transit system stops, we will lose the opportunity to connect our communities. If our transit system stops, the north side is left behind. After the panelists spoke, the mic was handed over to others, including Met Council Chair Susan Haig. Uh, I see that as another investment in equity. Most, but not all of the attendees were from North Minneapolis. We need to make sure that there are going to be businesses and some economic growth and not just a pass through for people looking out the window of a train that's going by. I think that the Southwest line is a good thing. I think it makes sense to have a line that's going through to take people from St. Paul all the way out to Eden Prairie. But that's not the heart of our community. And so we need transit options right in the heart of our community. And we need an agreement that, in fact, we're going to get economic opportunity right in the heart of our community. I always think, who do you expect to do it if you're not going to do it? I mean, I'm not, and with love, Gary has made an excellent question about equity. I think that's an excellent point. It's the right question. So, so excellent of a point that I'll tell you that I'm committed to it. All right. I'm in. I'm in. And we got two. Well, in. We I'm in. We got four. We got five. We got. We talked about the, the young lady right there said 32 percent minority hiring goal, six percent women. What is? Let me ask you a question. What is 32 percent times zero? Zero. So if the Southwest line doesn't happen, just saying. <laughs> what you say? What you say, Mr. Congressman? Yeah. I don't know if I heard. It. <laughs> well, my point is, we've got to say we're going to do it. That's what I say. Right. We're totally isolated if you don't have a vehicle, and it involves multiple transfers. The idea that we get this rail line built, and I can take a bus down Penn, and my neighbors can take a bus down Penn, and be connected to options in the suburbs. And in the lakes part of the city, I mean, it's it's a no-brainer. I understand some of the concerns that other uh, folks in Kenwood and other places have. I get that. I think we're all sensitive to that. But if we're talking about equity, that has to mean something. And that means connecting this part of the city to other parts of the city and to the larger metro area. It's a very simple decision to make. Either we agree that we're one city or we're not, and I hope we are. Uh, if you run uh, buses up and down um, different corridors on the north side, you will be connecting people to the light rail. Un we have a chance to turn what is now a wasteland, okay, into a promised land of jobs and economic development that will benefit the north side. We are dedicated to make sure that that area is developed for businesses, for people who live here now, for other businesses that want to come in so that we have jobs and we have choice. I'm with the Sierra Club. For those of you that don't know, it's the oldest and largest environmental organization uh, in the country. And we have thousands of members up and down uh, this corridor. We, we don't have a uh, position on the route, but we do want this project to happen. And uh, from an equity lens as well. 
Um, that first and last mile of any transit project is really critical for how you get to that train. The best thing that we can do is to encourage the elected officials, the folks at the Met Council, at all levels of government, to find a way to say yes. There's got to be a way to keep moving this project forward. If this project doesn't go forward, the whole network and system of a comprehensive transit uh, plan goes down the tubes, goes back probably 10 years, maybe more. Uh, we lose our place in the line. Southwest has a special position with the feds. And what we really are trying to build, I think, collectively, is a comprehensive transit system that creates a connection, a connectivity that's unheard of in our metro region that we haven't had since we had a streetcar system that connected the Twin Cities up to the suburbs. Now what I got out of that public forum in North Minneapolis was a message that we gotta get this project done. This is an opportunity train, Jeff. A family that can get by on one car instead of two has $10,000 a year more in their pocket. That puts them on the path to owning a home instead of renting a home. Our line connects to 14 higher education institutions as part of the Green Line extension. Yeah. That means we're connecting affordable housing to living wage jobs and the higher education that you need in order to get a better job and create a better life for you and your family. We also know that young people crave a less auto-dependent lifestyle where they're able to walk and bike and leave the car in the garage. This will give us that opportunity. We also know that businesses can't attract the best and the brightest if people have to spend more time in traffic than they do with their families. Say, Jennifer, thanks for coming. Good work, and uh, at some point, I want to take that train from the Mitchell Station to downtown St. Paul and maybe see a St. Paul Saints game. I'm with you. No transfers. Thank you. Democratic Visions is independently crafted by volunteers, mostly Democrats, from Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. From now through June, the five Southwest Light Rail cities and the project will be hosting informational open houses, answering questions, accepting comments, and holding municipal consent hearings. Go to these websites for dates and times and more information. presentation of guests and opinions on this program does not indicate endorsement by the state DFL party or DFL Senate District 48.